Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to my Life in the Universe pandemic series. So this is a set of short talks about biology in the universe, life in the universe, and things that I think are interesting, and I hope you might do as well. A pandemic seems a good time to think about life, not just viruses, but life right the way across the universe. So I don't normally get um, requests, but there was one on one of the YouTube videos that I posted, which was which of the moons that we uh, think host oceans or have oceans beneath their surfaces would be best for life, Europa, Enceladus, or Titan? So the question today is this, extraterrestrial life, Europa, Enceladus, or Titan? And this is a good opportunity to think about um, extraterrestrial life and what we know about some of the icy moons that have oceans beneath their surfaces. So the first thing I should say is we don't know the answer to this question. We don't know whether these moons have life, and we don't even know whether they could support life. We don't know enough about the chemistry to be able to say this moon can support life, this one cannot. This is a forthcoming activity to try and enhance, improve our knowledge of these moons to be able to make these assessments. But what we could ask is, based on the knowledge that we have right now, which is April the 23rd, 2020, so bear that in mind if you're watching from the future at some point that probably knowledge has improved. But based on our knowledge right now, which of those moons might be best for life? So let's have a think about these three moons. First of all, Enceladus. This is a small moon, about 500 kilometers in diameter or thereabouts, in the E-ring of Saturn, in Saturn's uh, rings. And it's a small icy moon that has an icy surface. It was observed uh, by the Voyager spacecraft in the 1970s and more recently by Cassini. And it's an extraordinary moon because from its south pole are erupting plumes of material into space from these cracks at the south pole called tiger stripes. And these plumes of material were examined by the Cassini spacecraft. And from that, those um, experiments and analyses, we can say several things about Enceladus that are really exciting. So let's think about what life needs. It needs a source of liquid water and we know those plumes are made of uh, water ice. They contain water ice, at least. So we think that that subsurface ocean, or in fact, we, we more than think, we are fairly certain that the subsurface ocean in Enceladus is made of liquid water, the solvent for life, at least life as we know it. So we, we know that Enceladus has a source of liquid water. Uh, what about a source of energy? Well, interestingly, in the plume material, we find hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and those two gases can be added together to make methane with the release of energy. And methanogens, which are microorganisms that naturally uh, use hydrogen and carbon dioxide in, in the deep subsurface of the earth to gather energy from the environment, could potentially use those two raw materials in Enceladus to get their energy that they need to grow and reproduce, producing methane in the process. And there may be other sources of energy as well. But the hydrogen and carbon dioxide are exciting because they definitively tell us there is at least one source of possible energy for life in that moon, amongst other possible sources as well. Maybe there are uh, microbes chomping on organic material, carbon containing compounds. So there's energy. Uh, life also needs a set of elements to build itself with, to build the chassis of life. And life is full of all sorts of different elements. If you look at the composition of your body, you'll find all sorts of elements from the periodic table making up your cells. But there are six that are essential, which are the so-called chinops elements. Uh, that strange word is made up of C, carbon, H, hydrogen, N, nitrogen, O for oxygen, P for phosphorus, and S for sulfur. And we need all of those six elements as a basic minimum to construct a life form, or at least life as we know it. And in Enceladus, we find all of those apart from phosphorus. Phosphorus has not been directly observed. But all of those other elements have been found in carbon-containing compounds, hydrogen sulfide gas, uh, other elements inside the plumes. So that's really good news. We think that Enceladus has liquid water, uh, chinops elements to construct life forms, and a source of energy. And the conditions do not seem to be too extreme. We think the pH is probably slightly alkaline, and there's lots of organic material in those plumes. Who knows? Maybe that organic material is even made up of fragments of of cells growing deep in the interior of Enceladus. Of course, we don't know that. It could just be ancient organic material. But what's exciting about Enceladus is that it seems to have uh, many of the basic requirements for life. And even more excitingly, um, those plume materials are being ejected into space. So in theory, all you have to do is fly through those plumes, collect a sample, and bring it back to Earth. And you can answer your question, is there life 
in one of the oceans. So the straightforward answer to that question that was asked on that YouTube video, which of the three moons is probably the best for looking for life, I think has sellered us, partly because we know the most about that moon and we know that um, we have a greater number of the basic requirements for life that have been met and measured in that moon, but also because it's ejecting material into space, it's probably the easiest place to go and collect a sample, to bring it back to the Earth. But let's think about those other moons that were mentioned in that question. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, about the same size as our own moon, a bit like Enceladus, covered in an icy uh, crust layer with a very recent, uh, recent surface layer, very few asteroid craters and comet craters that suggest that the surface may be a few million years old or less. There's very good evidence for a, an ocean beneath the surface of that moon. We can see the surface moving around. Uh, there's even been uh, tentative detection of plumes erupting from Europa, not quite as spectacular as Enceladus, but possibly plumes coming out from the interior of that moon. The problem with Europa is we know very little about the chemistry because there aren't plumes being ejected that we've been able to send a spacecraft through. We can only look at the moment at the surface and try and um, infer something about the ocean. We think that the ocean might have sodium chloride. It might be made of sulfate salts. There's detection of sulfate on the surface. Certainly over the history of that moon, we would have expected a carbon rich the asteroid and cometary material to have bombarded the surface of the moon and maybe some of that material has got into the ocean of Europa so that there's food inside that ocean for life. The truth is we don't really know about the chemistry. What's the pH of the European ocean? Is there lots of organic material? Are, we, uh, do, are there chinops elements? Is there plenty of phosphorus and nitrogen? And are there energy supplies? Well, we can dream up energy supplies if there's sulfate on the surface, we know that microbes can take sulfate and mix it with hydrogen and release energy in a process called sulfate reduction. And this is something that microbes on the Earth do to get their energy from the environment. So maybe uh, Europa has uh, hydrogen, which it can mix with that sulfate that has been detected on the surface of the moon uh, from spectroscopy and maybe life can get energy that way. But is there enough sulfate in the oceans? Is there enough hydrogen? These things we don't really know. So Europa may have a lot of water. We think that it might have uh, as much water as two times all of the Earth's oceans combined. So that's a vast habitat. And you might think, how can a, a moon the size of our own moon have two times all the water in the Earth's oceans? Well, you have to remember that the deepest place on the Earth's, in the Earth's oceans is the Marianas Trench, and that's about 11 kilometers deep. So the water on the Earth is actually quite thin and dispersed across the surface Whereas in Europa, the ocean may be very, very deep. So there's lots of water, even though the moon is small. So Europa is a fascinating world, uh, probably more liquid water there than Enceladus, but we just know much less about it. It's much more difficult to assess whether that would be a good place to look for life. And of course, unlike Enceladus, we don't think there's large amounts of material being ejected into space that we could go and easily collect. Although some people think um, that they have seen evidence for plumes coming out of the European ocean that perhaps could be uh, places for us to go and look for life or at least study the chemistry of that ocean. So that's Europa, another fascinating world that has an ocean, but we know less about it. And then we come to Titan, another moon of Saturn. So we're going back to Saturn now. Titan is an interesting world observed by the Voyager spacecraft, it has a brown haze from hydrocarbons, carbon containing compounds in its atmosphere from all the methane on its surface in its atmosphere, uh, reacting in ultraviolet light to generate these complex organic compounds that give it that brown, muddy, haze-like uh, look. But beneath that haze and beneath the surface of the moon, we think that Titan might have a subsurface ocean as well. It's going to be very cold, we think. It may even have to have liquid ammonia in there, ammonia, to try and maintain um, the temperatures at below uh, zero. We have to, we have to postulate that there's a, an antifreeze of some sort in the oceans. What about the chemistry of Titan's oceans? Could it harbor life? Well, that we have really have no idea. We have even less information than Europa. If it's got ammonia in it, it might have all sorts of exotic chemistries going on that we don't really understand at all. Is there energy? Are there chinops elements? Uh, these things we don't know. So we're only left with speculation with the oceans of Titan. 
Having said that, it's not impossible that we might be able to sample that ocean, not by necessarily drilling into the subsurface. It's possible that some of that ocean may have come to the surface of Titan in cryovolcanoes. These are volcanoes that work at very, very low temperatures and spew out cold uh, material onto the surface of a planet. And if Titan does have cryovolcanoes, maybe some of that water from the subsurface ocean is coming up onto the surface of the moon and we could go and collect some of that material or sample it in the future and be able to uh, examine it for life and to see whether it's habitable. So that's pretty much my ranking. That may change in the future. I would say Enceladus we know most about, uh, then Europa, then Titan. Where would I go first? I would go to Enceladus first simply because the material is being spewed out into space in these giant plumes. It's the easiest material to collect and it's also the moon where we know that the greatest number of possible uh, ingredients for life have been met. So in terms of um, being able to make that ultimate assessment of whether it could be suitable for life, uh, that might be the best place to go. So that would be my priority. Finally, one should say that even if we do discover that these moons have suitable conditions for life, that does not necessarily mean they contain life. We could have moons that have all the ingredients to construct a life form, but the origin of life never occurred. The chemical conditions were never right for those molecules to come together and build a life form. So we might have oceans that are habitable, but uninhabited. And that's something to bear in mind. So we shouldn't get too excited about the quest for life because merely finding an icy moon that is habitable would be a stunning discovery that there are other places in the universe that are at least suitable for life. And that would tell us something about how common the origin of life is in the universe. Maybe we live in a universe with lots of habitable spaces, but very few of them actually contain life. So these are some of the mysteries ahead, but I think it is exciting that we know enough about the icy moons of our solar system to be able to rank them and to be able to think about which ones might be best to go and search for evidence of life, and if not life, to understand better the conditions for habitability elsewhere in the universe. So in the meantime, take care of yourselves in the pandemic. We'll get through this eventually. And thank you for joining me.